All right, so we continue with separation and small x. Next speaker is Christopher Ayon. Uh, we'll talk about probing BFKL dynamics, separation, and diffraction of Hadronian colliders. So, 40 plus 5. Yeah, thank you. So, compared to the title, which was on the program, I had it diffraction because it was discussed in the previous talk. There is definitely some relation with uh, low X physics and also saturation. So, I will start with something which is basically a simple, just a reminder to discuss about the proton structure, so about in terms of quark and gluons. I will describe briefly the FKL dynamics inside what we call the forward Miller Nebel jets and the gap jet events. I will also discuss the gap jet event and diffraction, mention the diffractive event for the Pomeranz structure, and as I said, jet gap jet. And I will finish very briefly because it's a bit outside, I mean, like QCD, but photon induced processes, which is more towards the answer model of Oops, uh, yeah, so how do we can we avoid this? <laughs> Go slide side by side. You, we get two slides uh, side by side. Is <laughs> it <laughs> okay for me? It's <laughs> faster. Uh, that's a PDF file you it's gave PDF. us. Uh, it's not, don't look like this to my laptop. <laughs> um, I don't know why. I can it's tinker with it. Well, let's see like, if I just go. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Anyone, any thoughts? I've never seen this issue. Yeah, first time I've seen this. It's not too small for you, it's fine for me. Let's see if it's too small. Yeah. Under full screen. Yeah, that's <laughs> what it does. Okay. I guess it's too slight. It's the price of one. Okay. You want to try Adobe? Oh, okay. That's funny. Okay. Uh, you guys don't have Acrobat installed on this. Ah, one. yeah, because usually I'm using Acrobat, so maybe it's the reason. But if not, I mean, uh, let's go on like this. We can install it now if you want. <laughs> <laughs> then my talk would be finished, maybe. <laughs> um, well, let's, let's try real fast. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> There's um, a Adobe right there. Sorry. What? There's Adobe in the house. Just go with double slides. Everyone can see. All right, forget it then. Yeah, just take a see it, actually. Uh, if you put it in the back, you can see it. Or is it yeah, okay, so sorry for that. Did you try slideshow? Slideshow, it will just rotate, right? Yeah, the same way. Okay, good. Okay. Anyway, so, so I will start by describing, as I was saying, the, the proton structure. So, I mean, I think for this audience, it's not no use to remind you that the, the main place where we had uh, investigating the proton structure was at ERAP, which was the ERAP accelerator at DZ Hamburg, where we are colliding about 27.5 GeV electrons against 820 or 900 GeV protons. So the two main experiments were H1 and Zeus, so it was myself member of H1. So which kinematics are we uh, dealing with? So this is for the electron-proton interaction that you have here, either an exchange of a photon or the Z, or here you have also some charge current if you exchange here the W boson. So the big advantage uh, of error accelerator is that you can, there are different ways to reconstruct x and q squared in order to measure the proton structure function. And it will be the same basically uh, the, the IC. So you can measure the, the q squared, so the transferred energy scale, using, for instance, the, either the jets or the, the scattered electrons, and the same for the higgs Bergen variable. So, that's why, so the, 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 the protons picture that, that we have is the following. So this is a function of Q squared, which is the resolving power of the proton and the X variable. So this was already mentioned by Raju uh, in his previous talk. So what we can prove is obviously the Q squared evolution of the proton and also the X evolution of the proton. So when X is going smaller, the density of gluon is getting large. So the proton is gluon nominated. And I would say the natural evolution equation to probe for this kind of small x evolution 
is the Balinsky fadin kovalyev lipatov evolution equation. And this is what I will try to see uh, in the next slides. Did we see basically this kind of logic dynamics at the at era and then at the NHC or not? Before we can see if we go even to higher density inside the proton, where we would see saturation. So that for me, there are kind of two tests for us to probe this kind of small x evolution and then to see if we reach a very small x the saturation level. So, how does the event uh, look like? So, again, so it was this one, it's from each one, it's not the same in Zeus. So, you have the electron going in this way, the proton in this way. You see the scattered electron in the backward calorimeter, which is here. Some gels which are produced inside the liquid argon calorimeter. And in most cases, there is a lot of energy in what we are calling the forward region. In this region here, there are the muon detector and the forward calorimeters. It means that in most cases, the protons are destroyed in the final state. And I will come back to this when we discuss diffraction. Okay. So what was done is to measure the, the proton structure function F2, so using this formula, so you measure the cross-section in B in the and squared, and from there you can extract the proton structure function F2 knowing the value of F. And the idea is always the same, so how do you extract the quark and gluon density from the proton? You use this data, this cross-section measurement, in order to do next to leading order or next to next leading order evolution equation. So the big lab evolution equation for the Schitzer, Kepov, Kepatov, Karani, Karazi, evolution in two squared, and <coughs> determine, determine the proton structure in terms of quark and gluons, which allows also to predict the first cross-section of the Tevatron and the LHC. So I just want to stress, and this would be the same when you study diffraction in terms of a PDF, so if you look at the log to square dependence of the spectral function, so it's of course proportional to alpha s, and depends mainly on two terms which are here, with the splitting function for the gluon and the quark splitting function in order to extract the gluon and also the quark density in the proton. So just to, to flash briefly what was the kind of kinematical domain that is used, that was found for ERA and then for the LHC. So this is Q squared versus X, where you have the previous fixed target data, which are here, and the error domain, which is here in orange. So compared to the fixed target data, so they, they were required of the, we are going to much lower Higgs by about two orders of magnitude, and two orders of magnitude also in two squares. So it was completely new chemical domain, which was covered compared to the fixed target experiment. And just to show you, so these are the two main results of these two plots coming from the, from ERA. So the, the kind of, uh, one of the main results from the from H1 and Zeus. So this is basically the, uh, the cross-section, the F2 measurement as a function of Q squared for different values of X, which is here indicated, so probably too small to read, but it goes to a, a few 10 to minus 5 up to a 0.15 or something like that. And what you see is compared to the next leading order QCD, and you find a good agreement between next leading order QCD and the F2 measurement. So it means already one thing. So if we want to look for this BFK dynamics or this saturation dynamics, probably this is too inclusive. So we we'll need to have some dedicated observable in order to look for the uh, to look for possible saturation effects. If you go to extremely small x and very low square, some saturation model leads to a better description of the data. But the issue is that you are probably below the perturbative scale. And if you are for Q squared, which is below 1 GB squared or 2 GB squared, we don't really trust the, the perturbative calculation. So it means that we need this kind of dedicated observable if you want to look for this effect. And this is just to show you, again, it was already shown by Raju, so this kind of plot to show the gluon density, which is multiplied by 0 0.05, at low x for q squared of about 10 gb squared. So it means that the proton is completely gluon dominated when you go to very small value domains. That's why the BFK evolution equation, which describes how the gluon density evolves as a function of x, would be the kind of natural equation and natural dynamics to look for this kind of region. Okay, so I just want to make a bit uh, uh, parenthesis there, which is related to the, the EIC. And uh, I just want to stress that the, the, the knowledge of the heavy ion structure is much worse than the knowledge we have of the proton. For me, the EIC is a bit the same that ERA, when our ERA started, in order to increase our knowledge of the proton. What I mean is that the, the knowledge of the heavy ion structure as small x is very 
Letton, and this is a plot from the helper that I took from her article, which is here. And you see, this is basically what has been covered, which is here, the, the part which is, for instance, here in green and in red. And these are the domain in orange that can be covered at the EIC. So I told you before that we gained about two orders of magnitude in X, going, for instance, from the fixed target experiment to ERA. And we are in the same kind of situation for the EIC uh, collider. So it means really that what we gain at ERA, we will be able to gain the same for heavy ion structure. And since, of course, the ion density is much higher in heavy ions, we, are, we have some hopes to see some saturation effects at this kind of values of X already at the EIC. So just as an example, so again taken from the Elker paper. So this is the reduced cross-section at the function of CUSPER for different values of X. And you see that the kind of precision that you can reach on the avian structure, which would be a kind of similar precision that was obtained as error for the proton structure. That's why it's really one of the main motivation, I would say, for the, at least for me, for the electron collider, will be this kind of understanding of the avian structure. Okay. So now let me come to the main target. As I said so clearly, you know, what we have, probably the inclusive distribution are not the best way to look for saturation or even this low X uh, uh, summation effect. So we need to look for dedicated observable. So just a reminder here of the same kind of diagram, but it has been extended here, where the gluon density inside the proton, at very small hits, gets very large. So you cross the negative version of saturation. So one first thing which was proposed at ERA, which was kind of the natural, and when I'm saying ERA, I should say it is the same basically for the EIC. So the, this is what we call the very forward jet measurement at ERA. So you have the proton on this side, the electron on this side. So, and you see the idea is to measure jets which are as forward as possible. So as close to the proton as possible. Why is it like this? So you have here the, the electron, which is here. That is the Q squared of the virtual photon. And what we want, if we want to observe the BFK dynamics, we want to get the interval in rapidity between the jet and, let's say, the scattered electron to be as large as possible. So that here, from the BFK evolution equation, many gluons can be emitted on the ladder. So that's why you want to get some jets as forward as possible. And this is, again, also relevant for the AIC. We should have very forward detector in order to measure these very forward jets. So the detector should already think about this from now, basically. So, and then what do we need? If we have Q squared of the same order of magnitude as KT squared of the jet, the DIGLAP prediction uh, will be much smaller because as you know, for DIGLAP, the different gluons are ordered in KT. So if you have about the same KT of the jet as the Q squared of the virtual photon, this suppress the DIGLAP emission. So this was the basic idea of this forward jet contribution. That's why it was thought it could be a natural observable of this kind of BFK effect, since we enhance the BFK resummation compared to the DIGLAP uh, the DIGLAP part. So you think order in direction of the So this this sorry, this one the jet. Yeah, this is very what you call forward. I mean, let me go back to the diagram. Where is it? Forward of the photon. Yes. So you have basically this case where the jet will be as close as possible to the, the scatter of the, of the, the destroyed proton, which is here. The proton remnants are here, and what you want is the jet to be as forward as possible. Because you want a large interval in rapidity between the jet and the scatter of the So let me show you the, the results. I mean, what we did. It's already some uh, old uh, paper, but what we did is Sorry, compute. For, for you go. Remind us how forward did we go? So the, uh, I forgot the, the, what was the, the cut on the angle, but it was at the edge of the liquid atom <laughs> calorimeter. So the, uh, it was very small theta jets, actually. So I will show you one plot. Theta jet is not, uh, it's sort of few degrees, basically. Uh, I forgot the exact value, but it was few degrees. So I don't know if I can maybe remember what was the cutoff, but <laughs> yes, <it's>, I forgot. <laughs> so there is a few degrees, typically. Yes, yes, something like that, yes, yes. So, and what, what we did to, to make the prediction, the BFK prediction, so we used, of course, the effective part density, multiply, this is the BFK kernel, where we put it here, our text to reading log, to compare to the data. And this is the, the result which is here, which is shown uh, on this plot. So what you have is different 
values of Q squared, so 5 to 10, 10 to 20, and 20 to 65. You have different values of PT of the jets, which are here between, I think, 12 to 30, 30 to 95, and 95 to, I think, it's 400, which is true. And this is plotted as a function of x bar. So the data points, uh, they were measured by H1, are, are shown here, the different data points which are here. And they are compared to different calculations. The first one that I wanted to, to mention is the next to the null order QCD. So this is the dash curve, which is here. And the, so what you see is basically the next to the null order QCD, they fail to describe the data if you are at low PT and low X. This is the last curve, which is here. But clearly, if you go to higher PT, you get a nice description of the data. I yes, sure. Um, at that time, <laughs> because if you go so forward, yes, I, I don't have to tell you. Yeah, of course, I know that yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, it, at the LHC, it's inverse, but uh, because we're looking for this also at at, at Wigan, but the <coughs> GB. The 200 GB is basically impossible to go to how to be careful or get a, yes. uh, a good underlying event correction. But uh, for 500, it's better. But I was wondering whether that was done here. At already. that time, for that paper, yeah, we need probably to go back to the paper because very old data to check what was done because I also forgot exactly what they did yeah, at no, that time. I was just and wondering yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, I need to look in the old paper. But this is coming now from probably 15 years old or 20 years old. Yeah, because data. especially at low key. Really yes, yes. I agree. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So, and they are compared also with bleeding log BFKL. And bleeding log BFKL gives not a bad job if you are in this domain, but completely overshoots the data if you are at large PT as expected. And the next to leading log BFKL, which is the red curve, gives basically a good description of the data on almost all of it. So, this is, I would say, one of the only smoking guns at ERA where maybe some low X summation would be needed. And again, I must say that at that time there was also no next to next leading order QCD, which the law had been completed. And if you go to next to uh, next, leading, next to next leading order, of course it gives a better description of the data even as one. So that's why it's a kind of smoking gun, but not more than it. So there is no clear observation of the FK data. So then there was another process which was especially mentioned for the, the LHC or uh, also the Tevatron, which was the muller nabler jet. So muller nabler jet is basically the same kind of idea. You produce two jets in the very forward direction. You want a large delta eta because again, you want to get multiple blue on emission between these two jets. And maybe, I mean, if the KT are not too far away for these two jets, then aggress, again, you can suppress the big lap emission between these two. So this is basically the same kind of idea that was done at the, for the forward jet. So the, the way we, we did this, I mean, is for instance to study the difference in the signature angle between these two jets. And there are, have been many studies also by people uh, from Spain and people, Wallon and company from France concerning this uh, jets. But the idea was to compute what is the delta phi dependence of those jets. Because in the case where there are multiple pluon emissions, Delta phi should be less than pi because of this multiple gluon emission predicted by the BFL dynamics with respect to the Diglar traditions, which would expect to have two jets which are back to back and nothing else. So it's not the basic idea to look for this kind of azimuthal decorrelation between these two jets. And we predicted this, so this is what is expected, for instance, for BFL next to leading log for different values of eta between the two jets. So this is for the LHC, so six, eight, and 10. And what you see is that when delta eta is equal to 10, there is more decorrelation between the two jets than it is when delta eta is small between the two jets as expected. Okay, fine, so the, this is what, what we expected. But in fact, also, there are two issues which are related here, so I will just mention one of them, is that this calculation is not very stable if you introduce some higher order corrections. For instance, the BFL evolution doesn't imply energy conservation. So if you put by hand energy conservation inside the BFL equation, this is the effect that we just did at the, at the game, basically. So this is the kind of decorrelation that we were obtaining in the case of delta eta equal 10 and for jets greater than 50 GeV at the LHC. And once you put this kind of energy conservation, you get this one. 
So the, in fact, the decorrelation becomes worse. So this basically goes in the, right, the wrong direction. BFK has a tendency to be closer to the graph. In the case, you try to do some BFK uh, modification of the BFK uh, evolution. So this is also an issue concerning the term of the jet. In fact, the conclusion is not that clear. So basically now the question arises: do we have some better observable either as the NHC or the EIC in order to see again BFK saturation and maybe saturation effects? So there was one, so I took one example uh, which was uh, proposed, I think, originally by Cyril and the company, and we are doing some calculation related to this with uh, Federico, Martin, Tim, Soren, and, uh, and myself. And the idea is to, to look at P8 collision at the LHC. So which is the configuration that we need to look at? So this is basically the value of X from the heavy ion and the proton side. So either you have two jets, for instance, which are sampled, so you have one proton and one heavy ion. So if you evaluate the value of X in this configuration, X is smaller than one, but not very small. I mean, it can be something like 10 to minus two or something like that. So clearly, this configuration is not good if you want to prove saturation. There is another configuration in which one jet is very forward and the other jet is sampled. In that case, X on the proton side is of the order of one. And x on the heavy ion is smaller than 1, 10 to minus 2, maybe 10 to minus 3, but it's clearly, again, not small enough in order to see some saturation. So if we want to go to very small x, and this is this configuration, where we have both jets which are in the very forward direction, so in that case, x on the proton side would be of the order 1, but x on the heavy ion would be much smaller than 1, which is something like 10 to minus 5. So this is this kind of configuration that we need to look at experimentally if we want to be able maybe to see saturation. And what would be the ideal observable? So as you know, at the LHC, we can collide proton heavy ions or heavy ions against proton. So the natural observable will be to measure two jets in the very forward direction. And when I am talking about very forward directions, is a rapidity which is typically 5, 6, or even higher, 6.5. So we are going to very large rapidity. Because in CMS, we have a detector of kilometer, <coughs> very forward kilometer, which is called Castor, which allows to measure jets in this kind of region. So what we are doing now is to measure the cross-section ratio between PA and AP configurations with two jets going basically in the Castor direction. Yes? The thing I always worry about mm -hmm. in this kinematics is that both very large jets and then this edge of phase space effects, suppression effects. Yes, so the basic so one has to show that the systematics is really qualitatively different. That's something. Yeah, because now we are talking about on the bottom side to be close to one. It's true. Right. So we are going to this kind of a right. region which is a bit more tricky. Yeah. So we are on the heavy ion side, it's very good to be much smaller right. than one. But yeah, yeah, but you don't really need a proton that's close to one, you need a proton that's more than yes. uh, So, but what I hope is that, mm, let's see, because what, we will, what I want to do is the ratio PA over AP. So maybe this effect when, uh, in, in the other configuration will be vice versa. So XP will be much smaller than one and XA will be of the other one. So this would be the, the ratio that you want to measure to get rid of most of the systematics, experimentally at least, in, and hopefully to see this kind of saturation effect. And this was the uh, first calculation made by Cyril, which is RPA as a function of delta phi between the two jets in the very forward direction. And you see that the suppression factor is huge, I mean, going to 20% to 60%. So by measuring the ratio, hopefully we could be able to see the effect. Also, the systematics, in the fact that I'm talking about, would be pretty sensitive also to this PT, PT1, PT2. Yes. yes. And what we, what we can do, I mean, in this very forward calorimeter, yeah. we can measure phi, but we cannot measure eta. So it has to be integrated between 5.5 and 6.5 in the eta domain, which is not right. too bad, yeah. Yeah. but we can measure it. So this, and this measurement is being done now, uh, also in Kansas. And what we are going, what we are also computing with, uh, with these people, and also with uh, Martin and uh, Soren, so the, is how to predict the cross-section when we have one jet, basically, in the very forward direction, and we vary the eta distribution of the second jet. So going to delta eta, very small, up to a Muller-Nablet kind of configuration, where both jet are very large delta eta. So we are computing this cross-section in order to put it in a Monte Carlo to be able to compare directly with the measurement. And in parallel, we are doing the measurement in the CMS. So I cannot show you any data, 
but in, uh, in the process of doing the majority. Okay, so there is one topic that we are also doing now, which is supposed to be a nice way to look also for this BFK cross section effect, is looking at some gaps between the two jets. And when I am talking about gaps, this is jet one and jet two, it means that there is no gluon radiation at all. So we cut off basically all the energy which is emitted between the two jets. So again, so for this, you can use the BFK formalism. So this is described this, this here. So you have the uh, the parton density in each of the two protons times the amplitude square. <coughs> and the amplitude is written here. You have to sum over all the conformal spins, of many of them, and we have again the BF kernel, which is here. So what we did, in fact, in order to compare to the data, is implementing this BF kernel next to ending log predictions, basically, inside the Monte Carlo. Why is it very important to put it in the Monte Carlo for this kind of process? It's in fact at the parton level, okay, you imagine here a gluon, another gluon which is here. So the size of the gap is the same at the rapidity interval between my two gluons. But of course, in reality, you have jets, you don't have gluons. And this is the jets of a given size, it can be 0.5 in rapidity and 5 or 0.6, 7. So they have a given size in rapidity. The gap is between the edge, the edge of the two jets, whereas the delta eta between the jets is between the middle or the leading particles of the jets. So it means, by definition, the size of the gap is always smaller than the, the interval in rapidity between the two jets. So experimentally, what do we do? We take a region of the detector, for instance, between minus one and one in rapidity, where there is no activity, but there is a gap, and we measure the cross-section as a function of the interval in rapidity between the two jets. So it's what was done, for instance, in D0 where they, they measure the ratio, so the, so the jet gap jet divided by the dijet cross-section as a function here of the transverse energy of the jet, or the delta eta between the two jets for the low VT, so basically this point, and the high ET sample, which is here. So the data are compared with the BFK next to leading log calculation, and you see again a nice agreement between the BFK next to leading log and the measurement of this jet gap jet cross-section. So it's so the third probability, so it's put by, by hand, basically, and what we put for sense to compare here was 0.1, 10% of the vector. So of course, I mean, this is a rough approximation, because we know that it must depend a bit, at least slightly on the mathematics. So, so, excuse me, so, so the proper usual go down that way, that's exclusive, right? Yes, because this one yeah, is exclusive. So, so you, so you, are you able to compare new one samples? Yes, so the problem of Muller Navlet that, as I was mentioning, the, the next leading log calculation is not very stable. If you try to guess what would be the higher order next to next leading order effect on the BFK evolution, there is surely not a small effect. This was the, the issue. And this issue, of course, is a solar probability but that you need to put if you have a gap between the jets, because there is solar probability. I mean, I would consider this to be a bigger issue. <laughs> I don't know. At least experimentally, this is very clear. This is yeah, very why, why do you think this is nonsensical? Um, well, and also there's a big elephant in the room. Yeah, but what, what we, the approach we have for certain probability is that there should be a weak dependence on kinematics there. So, I mean, that's why they also is the same for diffraction. I mean, so in that case, as a function of PT of the jet, it should be more or less a constant factor. It should, in, it should be in the normalization, but not in the way the cross section is represented. Okay, but what about stability with respect to energy integration? <coughs> yes. So uh, why, why do you think it's any more stable than the increasing process? Mm. And it's the feeling we had when we did this study that it, it looks, I mean, to be more stable than the previous Miller Lavlet. Because Miller Lavlet was changing really a lot when we were trying to put this energy conservation, which was not the case within this trick. So they, this was not the case for this cross section. So it looked more stable. But this is just Miller and the best square. Square, yeah, yeah, it's Miller time process. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. So that's right. And uh, you know, my recollection the last time I followed it, there were these papers by Susan <coughs> Austin and so on and so forth, where they seem to have done fairly good results. I mean, the problem there was that you couldn't really distinguish it clearly from the from big, big lab. lab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Also, and uh, so it's probably not. Enough and observable, but because we are discussing this also, we I didn't mention it because it was a bit of lack of time. But what we are looking is a more differential observable for the Muller-Navier jet. For instance, the mini jets which are produced 
uh, above a given threshold or how the jet uh, basically emitted as a function of rapidity. So we are looking now with also given the fact that uh, the people at Sabio Vera and company, they have a Monte Carlo. So we are looking at more less, more differential observable, less inclusive observable, that would be characteristic of the other jet. Because purely the other jet, I don't think it's a good way to distinguish for higher order correction, the lab and the fluctuation or something like this. Yeah. So let me, let me go on, because <laughs> maybe I will have five minutes more because I have many questions uh, right now. Because <laughs> <laughs> if not, I will never manage to finish. Uh, yes, so what I wanted to mention, so what we are doing now is a full next reading log calculation of this uh, process. So because we're combining the next reading log kernel with the next reading log impact factor, so it's not an easy uh, result. Because when you introduce an extra ring lock impact factor, we mixed the loop, the momentum the loop, it's not factorized any longer. It involved the jet distribution with two final states, non analytic also formula which had to be used, but no, we with Luffy, Federico, who is one of the students in Kansas and, uh, and Tim, we are finalizing. So I would say probably by the end of this year, we will have the full next to leading log next to leading order with the next to leading order impact factor calculation of the jet the jet the events. Okay, so maybe I will skip just this part to go to move to diffraction because how many minutes do I have now since I don't have any questions? <laughs> okay, good. So this is a bit short. So the, uh, so the idea, so what I showed you so far is this kind of event. So there are an electron which is scattered in the very background of the calorimeter, that is a jet which is produced in the liquid background. And you see that in these cases, we see a lot of photon radius. But in about 10% of the events, it looks completely differently. You still have the electron, which is here, you still see some jets, but you see that the forward part of the detector is completely empty. So it means that for most of the events, the protons are intact in the final state. And we installed, in fact, like for instance, it is uh, the LHC, some dedicated detector, what we call Roman pot, in order to detect the scattered protons at very small angles. So the idea is not to understand, I mean, the structure of this kind of event that are called diffractive. Okay, so the kinematics is the following. So again, coming from ERA. So what you have, scattered electron, intact photon in the final state. You have this colorless object, which is called the pomeron, which is exchange. And XP is the momentum fraction of the proton, which is carried out by the colorless object. And then, if we assume that this object is itself made of quark and gluons, we define the variable beta, which is the momentum fraction of the pomeron, which is carried by the interacting parton, again, if we assume the colorless object to be made of quark and gluons. And by definition of X per n is simply the product of beta times X. So in the same way that we extract the gluon and the quark inside the proton that we described in the previous slide, we can extract also the structure in terms of quark and gluon from this colorless object from the problem. And illustrated on this plot, so this is the quark density <coughs> on the left as a function of beta for different values of Q squared, 8.5, 20, 90, and 800. And this is the gluon density as it was, for instance, attracted by H1. Okay, so let me just skip this one and go directly to the, to the LHC. So what can we do is to see at the LHC if we can access some more insight in the Pomeron structure compared to ERA. So there are two kinds of diagrams that I would like to comment uh, briefly. This is the way that we can produce two jets in the final state. And how can you produce two jets in the final state? Is by extracting one gluon from each of the two Pomerons. So you have one Pomeron here and another Pomeron here. And why, in order to assess the quark structure of this object, one possibility is, for instance, a jet, which is here a quark, plus a photon. The easiest way to produce photon plus jet event is to extract a gluon from one of the pomerons and a quark from the second pomeron. So clearly, if you measure the direct cross-section, it should be sensitive to the gluon structure of the colorless object, and if you measure the photon plus jet, to the quark and the gluon structure of this object. And what illustrated on this plot is the, the cross-section as a function of the mass fraction. What is the mass fraction? Is the digest mass, which you can measure in Atlas or CMS, compared to the diffractive mass. The diffractive mass is measured by square root of Xi1, Xi2 times S, where Xi1 and Xi2 are the proton fractional, fractional momentum loss for each of the two pomerons. And then by energy conservation, it corresponds to the full diffractive mass, which is here. 
And what we show on this plot is the cross-section of this mass fraction variable for different assumptions on the gluon density that are compatible with the error measurement. And what you see that we get about a factor of 10 in the difference of the cross-section by measuring the <coughs> cross-section. So clearly, this kind of measurement is sensitive to the gluon structure of the pomer. In the same way, we can do the photon plus jet divided by the digest cross-section, so the, the ratio, as a function of the diffractive mass for different assumptions of the quark density inside the pomeron. So d over u is equal to one fourth, one fifth, and so on, up to four. And again, if you measure the cross-section ratio, you get a factor of about three between the different cross-section ratio. So again, this kind of measurement will allow us to be sensitive to the quark structure of the pomeron. Whereas during when people were doing the era fits, since the, at the era it was not sensitive to the difference in quark densities, the fit always assumed that u is equal to d is equal to s, equal to u bar, equal to d bar, is equal to s bar. So the last measurement that is also being done, and hopefully by Morion, there should be some measurement of this. So, because we are also doing it in Kansas. So the, this is to measure the jet gap, jet cross section, but this time in diffractive events. So what we ask is the gap between my two just like before, but I ask one, at least one of the protons to be intact. So if, for instance, in this case, there are two protons intact, so it means here there is one pomeron, which is exchanged between my two jets, and in order to have the two protons intact, we have two second and third pomeron. In this kind of event, we have three pomerons. And what we measure is the ratio of the jet gap jet events when one of the protons is detected inside the one. And this is what we predicted <laughs> and with uh, Cyril with some calculations some time ago. And we predicted, we see that the proportion of events showing a gap between the jet in the case of at least one of the proton is intact in the final state is much larger than the jet gap jet events in standard photon uh, proton interaction. We were getting more something between 20 or 30 percent. It means that 20 percent or 30 percent of the event should show a gap between the jets if you detect at least one proton intact in the final state. So this cannot be missed because it's really a lot. Okay, so I will just in the five last minutes, I want to mention something that we developed also. It's less related to the to QCD, but still it can have some implication also related to the uh, EIC. So what we are doing, I think, is study this kind of events. So the LHC is proton proton, so two protons are intact in the final state, and you can produce some double U pair or photon pairs that are hit via photon exchange. So it's no longer a pomeron, but basically you use the LHC collider as a gamma gamma collider. So why is it interesting? It's because then we are sensitive to this kind of new coupling, two photons to a pair of W, two photons with a pair of Z boson, or two four photon coupling, which is new. So what I wanted first to mention is the standard model contribution. So how can you produce, for instance, two photons and two photons in the final state? The first <coughs> thing, sorry? Isn't it better to do that? It, it depends. Because in fact, if you do it in lead lead, right. then there, you need to cut uh, the, the photon, you cannot produce high mass objects because of the impact parameter with the two again, but they are very big objects. So you cannot produce very high mass objects. So if you want to go to high mass objects, photon photon is better, even if the flux is smaller. At the ion, you can produce diphoton production, but at low mass because you, you have a cut on the impact parameter. This, this is the, the reason. So maybe let me, let me finish and then we can discuss that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so what I wanted to say is so there are two diagrams, the QCD ones where you have gluons to produce two photons that the photon induced process. <laughs> so this is the cross-section as a function of the cut on the diphoton mass in the final state. The QCD diagram is the purple line. Here you have 200 GeV. And when you have this diagram correspond to the full black line, which is here. So when you are above 300 GeV, I mean, there is more than one order of magnitude between the QCD diagram and the photon diagram. So it means that we are, when we are discussing very high mass diphoton, which are produced, I will see the following, we are talking diphoton mass here about 600 GeV. You can forget about this QCD process, and this will be only photon induced events. So it's, why, what is the motivation not to look for this kind of events? It's because, I mean, for instance, two photon exclusive production can be modified by loops of new particles, or there are some resonance. So in the case of loops of particles, you get this kind of new coupling, which is proportional to the force power of the charge of the particle in the loop, divided by the force power of the mass, and also multiplied by the spin of the particle. In the case of the resonance, 
you get something which is gamma gamma to x to the, to the power minus 2, to the mass of the resonance to the power minus 2, and also proportional to the speed. And you can get typical coupling from the standard model events, I mean, depending, for instance, for extra dimension model or this kind of things, is typically of 10 to minus 40, 10 to minus 30 for the good. So, so I wanted to discuss briefly if we are sensitive to this kind of values. And this is how it looks like if you measure the number of events as a function of the mass of the two photons. So what you have here is the standard model production with your eta mod GV. So it means that the standard model production of two photons and two photons and nothing else is very small. This would be our signal for, for instance, this two anomalous coupling, 10 to minus 13 and 10 to minus 12. This is for strength or inverse strength of bound. And the red part, which is here, which is the only annoying background, is two photons plus pilot. What does it mean, pilot? It means you have two photons which are produced here, for instance, and the two protons come from the same interactions. But since we call, when we collide bunches at the LHC, there are multiple collisions within the same bunch process. So what can happen is that the two photons correspond to one interaction, but the two protons originate from secondary interaction that we call pilot. And this is the red curve, which is here. And this is where detecting the proton in the final state is really fundamental to get rid of the bad one. So because here, what is here is the ratio of the mass of the two protons and the mass of the two photons. So for my signal, of course, it should be the same by energy conservation. The same for the rapidity distribution of my two protons and the rapidity distribution of my two photons. So what you see on this plot is the ratio of the mass. This is our pilot background and this is our signal. By cutting on the ratio of those masses, you have the signal, it's clear. And again, for the difference in rapidity. So basically, what we get is, for using this technique, we get zero background events for 300 inverse to bar. So any signal, any event that would be observed would be a kind of beyond standard model events that could be assigned, for instance, extra dimension, or something that I want to discuss, which is relevant for the heavy air running, or also for the EIC, is to look for axion-like particles or dark matter candidates in a full mass range going from GeV up to TeV. But this is where we stand so far. I mean, there are many low energy experiments that exclude particles, such particles at low mass. But you see that the high mass, this is one GeV, is not that well covered. And what we, what we did using our technique at the LHC, by tagging the proton in, this, in the final state, we cover this kind of domain. So this is just, of course, we are doing the measurement also in Kansas now, so I cannot show you the results. But we gain sensitivity at higher mass, so this is basically above one TeV mass range. And also we improved by more than one order of magnitude the sensitivity for a mass of the, in this domain for the usual mass range of the LHC. So this is very more detailed, so this is this paper. Okay, so this brings me basically it bring me to the, the conclusion. So I discussed many inclusive measurements, but it's clearly not idea to look for saturation BFK. For this, we need dedicated observable so that there was very forward jet. So this is quite important. We need a very good coverage in the forward region at the EIC to do this kind of dedicated measurements. Die jets also. So for instance, we need to measure again jets in the very forward regions. Muller double jets, and we want to look, as we were uh, discussed, in more differential distributions. Now we are in the process of computing some prediction what is going on between these two leading jets, the Muller double jet, so called mini jet production between these two jets. So, and then, and then at the end, I discussed basically this photon exchange process, which is more related to exploratory physics at the LHC, but it's also something that we could keep in mind for the GV mass range at the EIC, where we can also probably look for action like or dark matter candidates, also using this uh, new accelerator. So thank you, thank you very much. Questions? Yeah, on the photon use, the photon system, what is uh, the role of the inclusive jet? I mean, photon can also yeah, but this the, this is very small in the domain where, where we are. Because of the kind of improvement of the mass? Yes, exactly. Because the, what we ask yeah, is basically two photons but very high mass above 600 GeV, typically, and uh, two intact protons. So this is basically the, 
the quark part, I mean, would be very much the national test. I think the two photons intact plus so such a high mass type photon. This is the, this will be really the amazing diagram where you have a, a quasi real photon which is emitted by the photon. It all the mass. For, but you want to study the anomalous coupling. Yes. You not use, if you uh, relax the constraint on the tag. Uh, yeah, but this we cannot because it depends on the acceptance of the detector. Like the, the acceptance of our uh, proton detectors, I mean, uh, yeah, both in Atlas and CMS actually, the mass acceptance starts typically at 450, 500 GeV. So we cannot go below that mass if we want to detect the protons intact in the final state, at least for standard running at the LHC. If you go to special runs at low luminosity, then you can access the low mass, for instance, vector meson production and so on. But then the luminosity is not large. I mean, then you are talking in just the cobalt of luminosity. So we cannot do this kind of exploratory physics, which requires a lot of luminosity. What, be, what is complementary to this is to look for a sense in lead lead, as a discovered <coughs> uh, in Raju. In that case, you can use the rapidity gap technique in the lead lead because you don't have this pile of problem. So you detect the two photons. So it's very clean events, actually. You have lead, lead, two photons in CMS, and nothing else. So it's very, very clean event. So this was observed at low diphoton mass, typically 15, 20 GeV. But, uh, but if you want to go to very large mass, where there could be some, uh, some diosar model effects, then you cannot because of this impact parameter. But when you discuss the, uh, the axon lag particle, then it's good because you can cover a high range in mass. So here you have one GeV, and here is one TeV. So it's complementary, I would say EIC, LHC in proton lead or lead lead, and LHC in proton proton, where we are going at one TV or above, whereas for the lower mass, which is again not well covered, you see in the top thing, I mean it's almost empty this region. So this is this complementarity between the accelerator is for sure. So does it answer what, uh, what you want to so, Sorry, if I could jump in. I mean, yeah, yeah. So you're looking for like beyond sending model effects, but there's also Light by light scattering was always an issue for G minus two, the you know, yep. G minus two. Yep. Of course, those are probably in space like photons. Uh, yes. In G minus two. So, yeah. But you can at least test the calculations, which could probably be analytically continued. Yeah. So, I, I was discussing it, in fact, two days ago with Silva, because what we showed is that our sensitivity is much better than G minus two. This we put in one of our paper. This method is much sensitive. But let's assume that the, what G minus two measure, the few sigma away from the standard model, take it at the, the value. What would it imply on the anomalous coupling? So it's something that we need to compute the other way around. So uh, the previous issue there, I thought was like a concern. Yeah. Really calculations. No, it was light by light scattering and there are interactivity interactions in there. I think that was the question, and here they can measure yeah, interaction. You can, exactly. So then this is what I was discussing this uh, two or three days ago. So let's take the value at two sigma as an input. So which value of the anomalous coupling would be needed to explain this? I mean, so this, we didn't do it, so I cannot answer you, but we'll do it very soon. I mean, it's very simple. Planned, not be, not be guided by. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be big. It would be big for us, because what we showed before is that our sensitivity is orders of magnitude better than G minus two for some the anomalous coupling. So, I have a question. You maybe you can do the slide. I cannot see it from here. Yeah. So, how do you incorporate energy conservation? You know, yeah. and which white belt if I understood correctly, and in correlation. So, I don't remember if I put it on the slide probably not. Yeah, yeah, so I didn't enter in the detail. The, the way that we did this is a kind of ad hoc way is by using the Del Duca and Schmidt uh, paper, if, if you know. Basically, they substitute the rapidity between the jet by an effective rapidity yf, which is described here. Where you, so it's delta eta multiplied by this quantity, where you have the alpha is cubed uh, cross section, which is this for jet production, divided by the leading log pf cross section, which is here. So and D sigma is the exact two to three contribution to the hadron hadron jet X jet cross section. So we used what was done by this paper by Del Dutch. But the way that we implemented again, it's an ad hoc way to do it, but this is really the way that we did it inside our calculation. All right, I think in the interest of the coffee break, we should thank Christophe again. <laughs> and let's say I mean at uh, eleven oh five. Thank <laughs> you.
Let's see. Yes, I think so.